Hi, I'm Father Joel, and welcome to Pilgrim Priest. I'd like to give a shout out to Father Kamal, who just started here as our new associate. It's uh, been an interesting adventure already, and he's been quite the blessing. So I'm uh, grateful for him, and I'm grateful for you. God bless. Back before my kayak trip, I decided to practice kayak rolling, like barrel rolls in a kayak. I thought it was a good idea. I'd taken a little class on how to roll your kayak back up if you're upside down. And uh, I, it was four weeks long. It was at the YMCA in Green Bay when I was living near there. And uh, after two weeks, they canceled the class due to COVID. It was spring of 2020. Um, so I, I, I learned how to get upside down, but I didn't learn how to get back up. So I thought I would practice, I would try it again. I watched a bunch of YouTube videos, so I was an expert. And then, uh, but I'm not an idiot. So I had, a, I had somebody next to me who was like, I, I paddled out into a lake and then he waded into the lake. And then if I couldn't get myself back up, it was his job to rescue me. Not terrifying at all, right? I'm sitting in the kayak and I'm like, okay, now I'm gonna flip myself upside down and then I'm gonna put the paddle like this, like we saw in the video, and then I'm gonna do the, the move. And then if I can't get back up, I'll try it one more time. And then if I can't get back up, then I'll just pat, pat the side of the kayak and you just come over and give me your hand and then I can, I can get up with your hands. And he said, okay. And so I sat there and I looked at the water and I said, okay, let's go over this one more time. And finally, I took a big breath and flipped myself upside down. And then I tried, and I tried again. And then I had to tap out and get help, and I got back up. And I'm like, okay, all right, pfft. let's uh, learn from this. So I did it again and again and again and again. And uh, eventually, out of about 40 or some attempts, I think I got myself back up about five or seven times. Uh, in the process. I did learn some interesting things that were useful for kayaking. One was that it's okay to be upside down temporarily. I could survive for like 30 seconds, even a minute. And so it kind of took that panic factor away. And the other thing was I learned a lot of mechanics for not falling over in the first place, like how to keep my kayak stable. But a side effect of that doing that was that uh, I got water in my left ear and I couldn't hear out of that ear anymore. So I went down to the, the pharmacy and I got the swimmer's ear thing and I got Debrox too, because I knew I'd had some wax in my ears. And, and I also had a pair of spare ear candles hanging around. So I did those first, stuck the candle in my ear, lit it on fire and didn't help. So then I did the other two things and it didn't help. So then I set up an appointment with an ear, nose, and throat specialist. And she looked in my ears and gave me her professional opinion. Your right ear is 50% blocked and your left ear is 100% blocked. And I said, what? No. So she got out of her vacuum cleaner and stuck a nozzle in my ear and she sucked the earwax out of my ear. It went well on the right side, but on the left side, my earwax clogged her vacuum cleaner and she had to get it unclogged. And then the last couple ones she pulled out really hurt. And I said, ow, and she said, that was right on the eardrum. And I said, I can hear, I can hear you. Like I had, it, it was a whole week of not hearing out of that ear and suddenly my ear was opened and I could hear clearly again. And so for the next day or two, I appreciated the fact that I could now hear clearly out of both my ears. You know, you don't realize how much you need that when you're in a crowd, for example, and someone is talking right to you, but there's noise around you. Only having one ear seems to really affect your ability to tune in to that particular person. I had struggled a lot with that. You know, this, it's, it's our desire um, when we have children, we want our children to hear us, right? And not just to hear us, but to listen to us. 
and to really understand what it is that we are saying. And so that's also God's desire for his children. In fact, the very line in this gospel is repeated at baptism. We say, um, uh, the, the, the priest actually touches the little baby's ears and then the little baby's mouth and says, may the Lord soon touch your ears to receive his word and your mouth to proclaim his faith to the praise and glory of God the Father. And so we see that it's also God's desire that we be able to hear him, that we really be able to listen, and that we really understand what it is that he's telling us. Um, and that should be our desire too. Do we clearly want, do we really want to hear God's voice? You know, I noticed when I was in daily prayer, um, I often have my list of prayers that I'm going through, and I don't expect the Lord to respond in any way. Now, it would be a little weird, let's face it, if I said, good morning, God, and I heard the tabernacle say, good morning, Joel, that would be a little odd, okay? But on the other hand, it feels, oftentimes it feels like when I'm praying, I don't want God to interrupt. Like if God were to say, hey, how you doing? I'd be like, oh, excuse me, I got to get this rosary done. Like, and then I got a long list of stuff. So God, uh, we, could, we could talk later. Uh, let me finish my prayer. As if somehow prayer is not supposed to be a communication between us and God. Now, God doesn't speak to our ears. He usually speaks to our hearts. But are we leaving space in our life for God to talk to us? Are we leaving room in our life for God to tell us what to do? Or do we figure it out? Do we make our plans? Do we have our expectations? And we're hoping God doesn't mess it up for us. That I've been there before where I had a long list of things to do and my hope was that God wouldn't throw me a curveball. Would everything would work out. That was my prayer. Lord, my will be done was fundamentally what that prayer was all about. And so if the Lord has different plans for us, if he knows that what we have in mind isn't what's best, he's going to have to interrupt. He's going to have to butt in. He's going to have to shake us up a little bit. When we are trying to accomplish our plans, we actually put ourselves in a position where God has to ruin things because otherwise, are we going to start listening to him? Are we going to start paying attention? I... Um, Father kamel has been here for uh, eight days now, and I really appreciate having him. Um, but I've also come to appreciate the fact that it's not so easy for foreign priests to always understand. So Father Kamel will sometimes respond, yes, and then I wait for further information that he actually knows what I said to him. I'm looking for him to repeat back to me something. And I find that oftentimes as I'm, as I'm talking to him, uh, he'll then ask me a question that I told him later or previously, like, oh, it was a good Mass tonight. We had 80 people in Mass. Oh, yeah, okay, how was your Mass? And he'll tell me, and then, and then I, it wouldn't surprise me if he later asks, and how many people were at Mass tonight? Oh, at St. John? 80. Yeah, it's like having a kid or a husband. But I'm okay with repeating myself now. Because when I get the feedback, I realize, okay, how much, how much is coming through, right? It's, it's really hard to tell how much someone else is understanding until they reflect back to you, until they ask you a question based on what you're telling them. And so I'm looking for clues, not just a yes and a head nod, which goes like this for him. This is how he nods to listen, and that's distracting. But it's okay. I'm just getting used to it. But if I pick up some interesting habits, forgive me. Because I'm trying to understand him too. And I might think I know where he's coming from. I might think I know, but I'm finding that I have to make more time to really listen, to really understand. Just because I've had a priest from India doesn't mean I know what his experience is like. Um, and I'm finding that I can't always assume that he knows how to do something, but I also can't assume that he doesn't know something. He's, uh, there are some things that he's really good at and other things that we need to talk about. And so it's this ongoing conversation of communication, trying to receive him, trying to be open to what he has to say, trying to not just listen, but really uh, understand. And so there's that sort of three levels, right? To really, to listen, to hear, 
and to understand. So the hearing part, right, that's the physical part where we're receiving what someone's saying, but the listening is our attention. Are we tuned in? Are we paying attention to them? And then the understanding, do we truly comprehend what they say? And so our desire with God is that we should hear, listen, and understand. And that's why you just heard God's word spoken to you in scripture, in, in the gospel. And that's why when, we, when I say a reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew, everyone in church immediately scratches their foreheads, right? It's the weirdest thing if you're not Catholic. You're like, what just happened? Well, we're putting crosses on our, on our heads, on our lips, and on our heart. Why might we do that? Well, as God's gospel is being spoken, I don't want those precious words to just fall to the ground. I don't want the word of God to be spoken to me and me to not hear it, to not listen or to not understand. So that's a little bit of a prayer. I want God's word to be on my mind. So I want to be thinking about what he's saying to me. I want to be turning it over in my mind. Um, the monks often compared meditation to a cow chewing its cud. We're thinking, we're getting more nutrition out of this. So I want to be chewing on it. I might not understand it at first glance. I also want to be repeating it. I want God's words to be coming out of my mouth. I want to be sharing the good news with other people. And I want it on my heart. I want to truly uh, receive it um, all the way into the depths of my being. This is where God's word is planted and where it can grow and bear much fruit. So we kind of want it to move from our head through our, our lips, our repeating it, into our hearts. And that should be our prayer each day. I want to encourage you to make a little time each day to read scripture. We know that the scripture is God's word. If you're not familiar with the Bible, you don't really want to start at the beginning and work your way through. You'll get in about two books and then you'll crash and burn. I would recommend, if you're new to reading the Bible or if you haven't picked it up in a while, to do uh, the Gospel of Luke and then the Acts of the Apostles. Those are a good, it's a two-parter anyway. Luke was, his Gospel was so successful that he made a sequel. You know how it goes. But you could also read the Gospel of Mark. It's the shortest, it's only 16 chapters, and it's the one that we'll be reading out of pretty often. And so as you read it, don't just speed through it but chew on it. Read a few verses, read a little section, and then think about it. Reflect on it. Speak to someone else about what you've noticed in there, and really let that word settle into your heart. Because we not only want to hear, we also want to listen, and we truly want to understand. God's word be on my mind, on my lips, and on my heart. It turns out that Father Kamal is quite athletic. He can actually jump higher than the Taj Mahal, which when you think about it, the Taj Mahal can't jump, so it's not as hard as it sounds.